So thank you all for joining us today for the program, Why We Study Old Dead Things in celebration of National Fossil Day. My name is Sarah Davis and I'm the public programs educator at the Illinois State Museum. Just without further ado, I will turn it over to Illinois State Museum geology curator, Dr. Melissa Party. Hey everyone, thanks for joining me today. <clears throat> So uh, before uh, we begin, I first want to acknowledge that I am zooming in from the Research and Collection Center in Springfield, Illinois, um, which is located on Peoria and Kickapoo ancestral land. With respect to the people of the past and the present, I would like to acknowledge the indigenous communities who lived here during forced removal and to acknowledge the more than 100,000 indigenous people who live in Illinois today. So as a practitioner of a historical science, paleontology, I know that we better understand our present and future when we have a sincere and accurate acknowledgement of the past. The past, present, and future are connected. So it's National Fossil Day. Uh, as a paleontologist, every day is kind of fossil day for me, but today is a special day in which we acknowledge um, all things fossils. And so the National Fossil Day was a day created by the National Park Service to um, promote public awareness and stewardship of fossils, and also to acknowledge um, and appreciate the value of fossils from a scientific and educational standpoint. The talk's gonna be broken into these two parts. Uh, so I'll be starting first with um, just some general awareness and then some stewardship information uh, for people who are interested in fossils. So very generally, fossils are the preserved evidence of ancient life. This is a very broad um, definition of what a fossil is. And so fossils are how we know that we have in the past had environments in Illinois that were at one point underwater. Uh, we also use these fossils to understand that in the past we had environments that were covered in tropical swamplands. Becoming a fossil isn't easy. Uh, it's actually a really rare thing. So if you have a living animal such as this uh, camelid here and it dies, what generally happens is that body uh, begins to decompose and you have things like scavengers that come in um, and start to consume and break down the carcass. And over time that carcass disintegrates further. And what generally happens at this point is the remains of that animal uh, just get recycled back into the environment and uh, it it's, gets taken up by plants and gets those materials get reused and you don't actually ever get a fossil in most conditions. This is especially true on land. So uh, one way to become or a way to actually more easily become a fossil is you really actually need to get buried very, very quickly, uh, not too long after death. So if you have um, special environments such as places where uh, like this animal can get, once it dies, gets washed into water and then is quickly covered in sediment as it's decomposing and then gets actually entombed and permanently buried, this is a situation where you'll actually uh, have the potential to become a fossil. And there's different kinds of fossil preservation that can occur. Uh, the first, I'm not gonna do a comprehensive uh, overview of uh, different types of preservation, just uh, some of the big ones. Uh, the first I'd like to talk about are permineralization and replacement. And these, these are different, but somewhat related processes. So permineralization is when the uh, void spaces, open areas within a living thing uh, get infilled with new mineral material. And so if you have seen something like petrified wood the, or um, ammonites that have gotten infilled in the spaces in the chambers uh, with, with new mineral material, this is permineralization. Replacement uh, is actually one of the more common ways of becoming fossilized. This is when the original fossil material is replaced with a new, with a new mineral. So if your bones contain uh, minerals in them, shells contain minerals in them, and those original minerals get replaced uh, over time uh, when mineral rich waters come into the sediments and interact with the fossil itself. These are some images I took um, actually from some objects that are on exhibit at the Illinois State Museum. Another mode of preservation here, uh, I'm showing are molds and casts. 
So a cast, uh, a mold, is what you get when the original material gets covered in sediment and then the original material um, dissolves and decomposes and goes away and you're left just with uh, the, an imprint, the outer uh, pattern around the fossil material. If then later that mold gets infilled again with sediments to create a 3D image of what the organism was, that is a cast. Uh, we also have a lot of examples on exhibit of compression and impression type uh, uh, fossils. And so this is when you've got the um, the organism gets buried in sediment and then gets, gets basically compressed and you're left either with um, a carbon, um, some remains from the, uh, the original organism or an impression uh, pressed between those layers of sediment. And some of the most uh, rare uh, types of preservation are uh, kind of re preserved remains. And so you can get this under really special circumstances um, where either you, you've got uh, cold environments or environments where the actual original materials have been protected from decomp decomposition itself. And so what I'm showing here um, is also another specimen that we have on exhibit. Uh, this is actually mammoth fur. And so you can actually see the original texture and the original color of this fur. And so this specimen is not from Illinois. It's um, it's from Siberia. And so this is material that was from permafrost. And so basically kind of refrigerated and protected from decomposition in, at, as it was buried. Uh, we also uh, have evidence of living things that aren't the original material um, or the original organism, but rather evidence from that organism that it was there in the past. And so uh, I have, for examples here, on the left is a footprint that was recovered from a cave in Missouri, Moreau Moore Cave. And so this is a footprint of what is thought to be um, from a Smilodon or a saber-toothed cat. And it's kind of amazing that this footprint survived for thousands of years. Um, so if you go into a cave, you should be very careful and look at the floor because you might actually see footprints, um, not just from modern animals, but from animals that have uh, long since gone extinct. And then also we've got here um, worm burrows. So something from the marine environment. Uh, we've got the burrows from an animal that was moving around in the sediment and leaving traces behind. So you know it was there in the past, but the actual organism itself is not currently there. So what kinds of fossils do we have in Illinois? Uh, well, Illinois has a lot of uh, rocks from a time period called the Paleozoic. Specifically, we have a lot of rocks uh, from the Carboniferous. And so the Carboniferous gets its name uh, because of the coal seams that form during these time periods. And it's broken up into two subgroups, the Mississippian, which is older, and the Pennsylvanian, which is younger. And we get a lot of marine fossils uh, from these rocks. And so you, we know from this that Therefore, Illinois would have been underwater at this time. So we're talking over 300 million years ago. Illinois was a very, very different place where we had a shallow ocean and we we're actually pretty close to the shore. Um, and this is where we get a lot of uh, plant fossils from these near shore areas, these swamplands that were growing in a tropical environment. And this is also where we get our state fossil, the Tully monster. We're often asked if there are any dinosaurs in Illinois. And unfortunately, the answer is no, we have not currently found any dinosaurs in Illinois, but we do have some rocks from the correct time period um, in which dinosaurs were living on the earth. And uh, so we have a lot of erosion that occurred. The rocks were um, eroded from the rock record, but we have a tiny amount of rock um, in the very westernmost part of the state and rocks in the southernmost part of the state, which I'm showing here. Uh, the rocks that are in the western part of the state actually don't have any fossils in them at all. So they're the right age, but they just don't have really any remains um, of, from living things that were around at the time. Again, going back to my, you know, some of my earlier slides talking about how rare it is and how, how difficult it is to become a fossil. The rocks in the southern part of the state, on the other hand, uh, do have fossils in them, uh, but we have not found any dinosaurs in them. Instead, what we have are 
remains from plants. And so I have some images here from some specimens that we have on exhibit, uh, some leaves, but also we've found uh, fossil wood as well. So we know that land was present and we know that there was vegetation present. And so there were habitats and almost certainly there were dinosaurs probably living in those habitats. So, um, you know, we're still kind of holding out hope that we might find evidence for dinosaurs someday in Illinois, but um, for the time being, uh, we currently don't have any. And then the, the last big group of fossils that we have in Illinois, which is actually what attracted me to the Illinois State Museum and the job that I'm currently occupying, um, is we have a really good record from the last ice age. So the very most recent uh, geologic time period um, uh, where we've got megafauna, and when I say megafauna, I mean things that are very, very large. So things like um, mammoths, mastodons, giant ground sloths. Um, and this is a time period known for uh, periodic uh, glaciation and deglaciation. And so a lot of the sediments in Illinois are actually influenced by this time period. The deposit, a lot of the sedimentary deposits you find all across the state with a few exceptions um, are a res result of these glaciers moving over the surface um, and leaving behind sediments. So real quick, uh, I'm gonna talk about the next thing in uh, for why we have National Fossil Day and that's stewardship. So stewardship is an ethic that embodies the care and management of something. This actually came up uh, recently in current events involving um, parcels of land, uh, Bears Ears and Grand es uh, Staircase Escalante, which are national monuments, the latter of which I'm showing here. In 2017, the size of these monuments were drastically reduced in size, which left a lot of habitat, fossil sites, and land of importance to indigenous people uh, vulnerable to damage. So paleontologists actually joined a coalition of indigenous, indigenous people and conservation groups in efforts to restore these monuments to their original size. Um, and actually recently this month, they were restored to their previous extent, which helps protect the monument's value to indigenous culture, world-renowned paleontological resources, outdoor recreation, biodiversity. And this actually restores the conservation status of more than 1,400 scientifically important fossil sites. Um, stewardship in paleontology also includes education, educating the public about how to responsibly enjoy fossils, which are a non-renewable resource. Um, so this is a, a reminder that removing fossils from the ground is an extractive process that does impact the land. So we have to do it carefully. So fossil hunting is a really fun and popular hobby and it can be enjoyed responsibly. So some general rules here, um, taking anything from a national park is actually a federal crime and so you don't wanna do that. Uh, private property, uh, people, you can collect fossils on private property but you need to make sure that you've get, gotten permission uh, from the people that own that land and there might be certain restrictions depending on where you're collecting on who actually owns the mineral rights uh, to those lands. It's always a good idea to check, to check state and local regulations on the possible restrictions for fossil collecting. And in general, um, even in places where you can collect, you are usually limited to surface collecting, so no digging um, of invertebrate and plant fossils. Uh, there is actually um, a place in Illinois where the public can legally um, go collect fossils with some restrictions and with a, a fossil collecting permit that you basically just print online and carry around with you. And then you report what you find to the state. And this is uh, Mazonia Braidwood Fish and Wildlife Area. And so this is open uh, to the public for um, fossil collecting during certain times of the year from March 1st to September 30th. So unfortunately we're, we're sort of outside that window right now. Um, but I encourage people to, to check this out. You can find um, some really nice fossils. And these would be these, um, those Maison Creek nodules that, we, um, that are so famous in this state. Um, in general, vertebrate remains are protected. And um, you also should just be aware of who else has a stake in the land that you're using. So even if you have a permit and you've got permission uh, to be somewhere and take fossils, it's a good idea to keep, keep in mind like who else does this, who else is using this land um, and do you want to minimize the impact you're having on those people? 
So what do you do if you actually do find a vertebrate fossil? Well, one thing you can do is um, contact the Illinois State Museum if you're in Illinois. Um, and we've received some really important donations that we've taken into the ISM fossil collection over the past uh, several years. And I've got some of them shown here. Um, so the top left here is actually an elk jaw, and we do not currently have elk in Illinois. So this, this specimen here actually indicates to us that this animal uh, was present here in the past. Um, we've gotten this fabulous uh, bison skull uh, that was found by a gentleman who actually likes to go canoeing and he finds vertebrate remains from fossil, fossil vertebrate remains, I think pretty regularly. Um, but he found this really great skull, a uh, partial skull, and it's actually on exhibit on the second floor um, at the museum. So if you haven't wandered up there, uh, do check that out. And then uh, we also have in the lower left here, um, this is actually a partial um, part of a pelvis. It's it's hard to tell just from this one piece if this elf if this elephant is um, a mammoth or a mastodon. Um, but since mastodon are one of the most abundant and common vertebrate fossils that we find in the state, it's it's a pretty good chance that it's that it's a mastodon. And so what makes a great donate donation to the museum is actually having the information that goes along with the specimen. It's a really nice specimen that's great. It's nice to look at. It might be um, you know, something that the public would enjoy seeing, but from a scientific standpoint, and as far as like uh, tracking Illinois' natural history, we really need to know where did you find this thing? And so if you can provide us with coordinates, uh, the even potentially where on a map you found it, uh, what other sediments were there, that kind of information is super important to us. And so that's the difference between a really a good donation and a really great donation. So moving on to the second uh, part of the talk here, where we're gonna get into the value of fossils. We're we'll talking about uh, from the scientific and, and educational standpoint. So we all know that paleontologists study fossils, but why? Why do we study old dead things? Well, some paleontologists are actually employed uh, in the natural in natural resource industries. Uh, so these are paleontologists that are employed to do um, what's called biostratigraphic correlation, where they actually uh, look at sets of fossils within the rocks to determine uh, the age and position of those rocks and then track them over space so that um, we can find natural resources. Um, and so they're, they're responsible for, for actually identifying uh, places where we can find things like coal um, and natural gas. Um, and we also, what's important in this type of industry are what, call, what are called index fossils. And so these are fossils that um, exist for very short periods of geologic time. So they're present in the rock record and they only exist for a relatively short amount of time. And so they are diagnostic to those rocks. Uh, another important thing is that generally index fossils uh, need to be geograph geographically widespread. So if you're trying to correlate a, um, a rock in one area with another rock in another area, it helps if that index fossil is widespread so you can actually um, compare those locations. Index fossils evolve quickly, which is why they have um, different species are in the rock record for brief periods of time. And index fossils are actually used to define periods of geologic time. I am not that kind of paleontologist. Um, uh, I am interested in an area of paleontology where we're actually looking, using the fossils to look for evidence of change as well as adaptation through time. Uh, big important thing in paleontology, uh, fossils are, are a key piece of physical evidence of evolution. And this is probably one of the, what I'm showing you here is one of the most uh, famous fossils um, that really informed us about the evolution of flight and birds. And so this is Archaeopteryx. It's a really nice specimen that was found um, in what's called a Lagerstätten or a, a, a place that has really exceptional preservation. So this location was in Germany. And what's really interesting about this fossil is that it has a lot of characteristics that you see in dinosaurs and it also has characteristics that you see in birds. Um, because of the fine sediments, you can actually see feathers, flight feathers on the skeleton. Um, but it also has, you know, 
very classically reptilian dinosaur characteristics such as teeth. Um, and so this, this specimen was really important in sort of piecing together our understanding of how birds are actually related to dinosaurs. And since this fossil has been found, we've actually um, found many more specimens that have uh, things like feathers in them and further reinforcing this idea that birds um, are, are not actually just descendants of dinosaurs, they're, they're actually living dinosaurs um, today. Fossils are also really good and direct evidence of different habitats and environments. So uh, we can look at an assemblage of leaves and, and make some inferences about the type of environment that was present. We know that in modern environments, uh, habitats, forests that are more tropical tend to have more species of plants that have um, the edges of the leaves are smooth as opposed to jagged and toothed. They also tend to be a little bit bigger. So we can actually take that information and go back into the fossil record, look at assemblages of leaves and figure out the proportion of species that have these smooth leaf margins and say whether or not that, that habitat was a tropical environment or a more temperate type of environment in the past. I guess I'm on a fossil plant kick here, um, but plant, uh, fossils are also evidence of adaptation to, to change in the environment. And so what I'm showing here on the left are, is a living ginkgo and a fossil of a ginkgo. And so ginkgos have actually changed very, very little uh, uh, over time and what are known as living fossils. So these are organisms that are alive today that have a fossil record in a very, very, um, they basically look like the, the fossil version of themselves. Well, what's actually also really fascinating about this specimen with these leaves is that it's not just an impression of the leaf. These leaves will sometimes leave um, the, a waxy cuticle from the original leaf. And what you can do with that cuticle is actually you still can see um, these pores that form on the bottom of the leaf. And what these pores are for is exchange of water and CO2, which we know that plants take up CO2 um, and give off oxygen. And so um, what we know from looking at the fossil record and from doing experiments is that plants um, will respond to differences in the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, the availability of water and temperature. And actually when you have uh, time periods where there is lots and lots of CO2, uh, plants will produce the number of these pores in their leaves. So you can actually look at these, um, these ancient pores uh, from, the, from the leaves and have an idea of what's going on climatically. Fossils can also be used to put modern extinctions into context. So uh, there are a of major conservation concern are the number of species that are going extinct. So um, I've blocked out part of the figure here because I just want to quickly walk through it. What I'm what's on the bottom of this graph is uh, the, the year, the time interval. So we've got from 1500 to 1600 up to um, uh, 2014. And then what's on the vertical axis, the y-axis is the cumulative extinction as a percentage of uh, species that are being evaluated for conservation concern. Um, and so cumulative means that we're just kind of adding on um, over time. And so if we look at the first part of this figure here, um, so we're looking at vertebrates first, the cumulative extinctions dramatically increases um, as you move forward in time. And you can also break this out to look at specific vertebrate groups. So remembering that vertebrates are animals that have backbones. So this is mammals and birds, and then, you know, other vertebrates, sorry, her, uh, herps, so reptiles, amphibians, fishes, um, are also seeing these increases in extinctions over time. And then we've got this dotted line at the bottom here that says background. Well, how do we know what the background extinction is? That informa information actually comes from fossils. And so we can look into the fossil record and make estimates on what is, you know, quote unquote, normal rates of extinction since species do go extinct over time. Most things that have existed on earth are actually extinct. Um, but because the earth is old, uh, there's plenty of time for new species to come, up, come around. And the background extinction that we would estimate 
um, from two extinctions per every 100 years per 10,000 species is represented in that dotted line. And so this provides a frame of reference for actually assessing like how bad the situation currently is. And living things are facing multiple challenges. We're fa they're facing climate change, which is occurring, as well as ha habitat loss. And a problem is that there are actually few long-term modern ecological studies to assess the effects um, of these challenges. Now, most, most people are actually surprised to learn that most ecological studies only occur for maybe a handful of years, however long it takes to like do a five-year dissertation perhaps, um, is how long most of these studies actually occur. So then the question is, are there natural experiments we can use from the fossil record to look at things like climate change and habitat loss and extinctions? And it turns out there is. Um, this is where um, my focus is in, which is the Pleistocene or the, uh, the, the megafauna extinctions that occurred on the globe, including North America, where we lost um, quite a few species of, of large animals. So, and this is similar to the modern where we have, you know, we're getting rid of large carnivores. We're also losing a lot of really large herbivores. So what are the con consequences of those losses? And can we learn something from the past to better understand the present? So this is my conceptual place to see. I'm showing body size categories here from left to right with the very largest things on the left side and small things on the right. And then um, carnivores on top and then herbivores on the bottom. And all of these arrows are here to illustrate you know, potential interactions between different species. So if this was a community of organisms living together, these might be sort of how they're interacting with each other. And so I've mentioned that the Pleistocene is um, it primarily affected large things. So how did this actually impact our conceptual Pleistocene? Well, we lost a lot of big things. Um, the numbers here and the amount that I've grayed them out um, represents the intensity of the extinction for that particular body size. And um, whether you're an herbivore or a carnivore, we see a majority of the losses in the very large herbivores um, and also the very large carnivores and less so um, with the smaller organisms. And I've also grayed out some of these, um, these connections that you see in the community. And I really love this quote because I really think it actually illustrates you know, what, what is of such concern here when you lose species you're not just losing the organisms themselves, you're actually losing the function that that animal had um, and also interactions with other species. So what escapes the eye is a much more insidious kind of in extinction and hidden, the extinction of these ecological interactions. Recent research into the Pleistocene extinction has actually um, um, started to focus um, a little bit more on what the consequences of these extinctions were. For a long time, we've had a lot of discussions on the causes, um, but we know that the extinction occurred and we know that we can learn something from it to help us inform the present. And so these studies have really focused on uh, what is the change in the function of the ecosystems following the extinction, the influence of megafauna on the environment. And this is really important for places like Africa where we still have some intact me megafauna. And what we're doing is we're using the fossil record to leverage time. Basically, we have this long time period that we can look at. We can, instead of trying to run experiments in the present that could take decades or a century, we can look to the fossil record and these natural experiments to understand sort of where we're headed. And so I'm going to highlight a couple of studies here as I wrap up. Um, this is a really interesting study that came out in 2016. It looked at the impact of large carnivores on ecosystems, basically what has been lost in these communities. And I've got um, part of, the, of a really important figure from this study here at the top. So basically this is what the legend for the figure is going to be. Um, you have the, you're, there's gonna be different carnivores and the dark blue bar is the typical prey size that that animal um, usually goes for. Um, and then also the light bar is sort of like maximum prey size, what that thing could maybe be able to occasionally catch. And then 
uh, the three different shades at the top are the estimated size of proboscideans, so things that are elephants, um, at different ages. So they go from being very small to being very large. And being very, when you're very large, you pretty much have escaped uh, predation. Um, and this is important to, to consider because we know that herbivores impact vegetation. And I've, I'm, I also have a picture here um, from the collections range here at the RCC uh, showing a large collection um, from a single locality of 30 different um, individuals from mastodons. And we know that in the past there were lots of herbivores, not just a lot more of them, but also a greater variety of herbivores. And we know that herbivores really can impact vegetation. And so uh, actually in places like Africa, elephants can really impact the vegetation a whole lot. And so the question is, what actually controls herbivores? And so there's this idea that, well, okay, well, maybe it's carnivores, but elephants are so big, um, can, can carnivores actually um, make any, uh, have any, exert any kind of control over elephants? And we know that from, from studying modern systems that body size affects the kind of prey that carnivores can handle and consume. And so there are energetic and physical limitations to the size of prey that a carnivore takes. It has to be a big enough prize that it actually gets enough energy from it, but not so big that the animal can't handle the prey item. And so if we look at uh, modern carnivores and also extinct carnivores, what we actually find is that based on what we know from the modern, um, it's, it's entirely likely that these carnivores were probably able to exert some kind of pressure on elephants. Large carnivores likely had the ability to hunt them. Uh, we also have direct evidence as well from, some, uh, from a cave in Texas called Friesenhan Cave, where we actually have Smilodon present and baby mammoth. So these animals were definitely consuming small uh, elephants. And this is really important for rewilding. So if you're not familiar with what rewilding is, uh, rewilding is uh, this idea that we're going to reintroduce uh, animals back into habitats as a form of restoration um, and that it will, it will improve those environments. So if if you want an intact system, you perhaps don't wanna just reintroduce herbivores. This may also involve uh, reintroducing carnivores um, as a mitigation method as well. Uh, another interesting study, um, I, I say interesting, I was on this paper, um, is that you, we typically think of climate impacting living things. And we kind of flipped this on its head by looking at whether extinctions can impact climate. Um, we know that large herbivores produce methane as a part of their digestion. So you have these uh, large animals, they're taking in a lot, of, a lot of vegetation and they're actually using microbes in their, in their gut to help digest those, that vegetation. And as a byproduct, this produces methane, which is a, a pretty strong greenhouse gas. And we actually see a decrease. We would, we've calculated the decrease in methane you would ex expect with various different extinctions in Earth's history. And we did this through body size relationships and fossil data. So we know uh, what species were present. We know approximately how many there were and how big they were. And so this little uh, mass mammoth I've got on my, my, my upper plot here is actually indicating uh, where the drop in methane would be coinciding with uh, the Pleistocene megafauna extinction. Uh, the kind of sad thing that we took away from this, uh, this study was that um, methane producing wildlife have actually been largely replaced by livestock in the modern. So if you look at this bottom graph here uh, and compare the, the end Pleistocene, the teal bar is the methane emissions per year uh, from uh, wildlife that would have been present during the Pleistocene. And if you look all the way to the right, that dotted kind of speckled bar there um, is the amount of methane that is emitted per year from livestock. So we basically exchanged wildlife um, for domesticated animals. And the last study I'm going to talk about here are how we, we can use the, the, the Pleistocene extinction to understand um, impacts on interactions within communities. And so this study looked at uh, canids, dogs. Uh, so we had a pretty diverse community of 
canids in North America, uh, living ones. And then in the, the bottom figure here, I'm showing, uh, of course, the largest of these in, in North America, the, at the end of the Pleistocene, the dire wolf. And what we did was we took the occurrences of these animals and modeled their geographic distributions at different time periods through time and uh, found that they were adjusting their geographic distribution following the extinction, but they weren't doing so in a way that was just simply tracking climate and environments. They were, they were, they were moving independent, independently in some sense from the climate. And what I'm showing in this, in this image, uh, the dark animals would be the animals that were present for a given time period. So the first box here or area here is 20,000 years ago. So this would be before the extinction. And so the very largest was our dire wolf. There's gray wolf present in the continent. Uh, shaded out is domestic dog, uh, which would be kind of an intermediary between wolves and the next size down coyotes. And also this, the darkness of the lines is there to illustrate the strength of the connections between these different body sizes within these communities. Um, and if you look forward to only 4,000 years ago, dire wolves have gone extinct. Uh, we have domestic dogs now present in North America. And what these communities have done is these animals have shifted on the landscape in a way that actually resulted in weaker interactions between other canid species. And there's possible, re possible reasons for that are um, shifting to new prey species and possibly competition, especially if you have humans and dogs present on the landscape that may provide really strong competition uh, for the native species that were present um, on the continent. And so what this illustrates is that species can move and adapt um, potentially. And so this is important looking to, to the future uh, with climate change and, um, and, 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 and habitat destruction is that we need to, if animals are going to, uh, going to cope with these challenges, uh, we may have to um, find ways to facilitate their movement and adaptation. And so I just wanna wrap up. Um, thank, you, thank you for joining me today. I hope that you leave this talk um, realizing that fossils are interesting, beautiful and important and that studying old dead things helps us understand the present much better. And please share your fossil finds with the museum. If you find anything really cool, um, let me know about it. And I wanna just wish everybody a happy National Fossil Day. And I'm ready for questions if there are any, and I think we got, oh, we've got time, definitely. Do we have any questions? I'm checking out the chat um, just to see if there are any that have come in. Oh, they kind of get buried. Boop, boop, boop. Looks like we've got one question. What is your favorite fossil in the ISM collection? My favorite fossil in the ISM collection. Okay, that's that's good because I have a lot of like favorite fo uh, fossil animals. Um, I think my favorite uh, fossil in the collection is actually on exhibit um, near the bone bin. There is an entire uh, bear paw that's been fossilized. Like, in place that's from a cave. Um, it's really, really cool. And it's all still like connected. The bones are all still connected to each other and it's really big. And you can sort of like get a real sense of um, how big this animal was. And it's really neat. The, the preservation is exceptional. Any other questions before we wrap up? All right. Well, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Mel, for this very fascinating, interesting program. I know I definitely learned a lot. Um, and thank you all for attending. We hope to see you at a future museum program.